Okay, so I think we can start in, in a minute or two. So yes, maybe I can already start introducing a bit uh, the session. So we have this session on, on market modeling and, and three, three presenters today. Um, I found it personally quite interesting that we have, uh, we're talking about energy or electricity market modeling and there are two papers using machine learning techniques. So it seems that this is something uh, that is coming up more and more. Uh, first, we will have, um, Ibrahim Abada from NG Impact and, and Xavier Lambin. Uh, it's a duo of already still quite young, but already quite uh, famous energy economists uh, who will use, who will show their work on, on how, how actually machine learning algorithms could lead to certain uh, competitive outcomes in power markets. So which is really a new application of, of this type of algorithms in, in at least in the sphere of, of power market modeling. Uh, then we'll have um, Erik Heilman from University of Kassel with, with Heike Wetzel and Janos Henze, who will uh, use machine learning to forecast uh, electricity or energy consumption data. And uh, last but not least, we'll have Liliana Novokavska from Imperial Business School together with Richard Green, who will uh, use uh, econometric models or, or econometrics to identify the drivers uh, behind the electricity prices in in, uh, in England. So as far, this is the introduction. So I leave the word to, to Ibrahim Abada. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, can you see my slides correctly? We see it in this kind of mode that we also see your next slide. So I don't know if that's okay. the one. Uh, all right, let me share that again. Do the sharing differently. Not yet, we see it again. Oh, sorry. Ah, it's a bit, there's the same. Okay, for some reason, I cannot. Uh... Maybe you can quit the sharing mode and try again or something. I think on this display settings, um, you can switch the mode. You can click. Is it, is it better now? Okay. Not optimal. It's the one where you see uh, the whole PowerPoint uh, okay. interface. OK. Um, so you can start okay. again. Let me, let me start again. Yeah. Thank you. 
tell me if it's better. Is it better? Uh, we see Zoom, not not PowerPoint. Ah, yes, now we got yeah, it. We got perfect. it. Okay, very good. So sorry for this. Um, so I'll try to be quick here. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. My name is Ibrahim Abada, and I am an energy economist and manager at NG Impact. And the work that I'm going to show you today is indeed uh, a joint work that I did with uh, Xavier Lombin, in which we try to understand whether there is a risk of seeing algorithms collude in power markets. Um, and if yes, we wanted to understand whether there are some simple ways to regulate the algorithms and the markets so, to avoid and mitigate the risk of having this algorithm collusion. The main idea of this paper stemmed from a simple observation, um, which is that algorithms are being used more and more often in the um, operations of smart electricity devices in electricity systems. So this is a non-exhaustive list of possible applications of smart algorithms to um, operate some devices. So if you consider only end users, for instance, you can think of the home energy storage devices, power wall of Tesla. You can think of the increasing penetration of electrical vehicles and smart charging devices. I'm still thinking about automatization of the demand response, for instance. But you also, if you take a wider view and look at maybe a macroscopic system, you are also going to see that there are some national grid operators who are thinking of using more and more algorithms to operate the national grid, for instance. One example is the French Ringo project, where there is this RTOTS operated virtual storage using machine learning. There is the current and past discussions between Google and the national grid operator in the UK where it has been proposed to adapt and to develop adequate algorithms to manage the national grid um, optimally in an optimal way. Um, all right, so when you see this, you might think that this is a good news because algorithms indeniably come with the property of being efficient. We know that, and it does make sense for an operator, for instance, it can make sense for an operator to use a machine learning algorithm to operate the grid because he hopes that this is going to reduce the cost of the system. So it can be a good news. Now the question is what happens if you see a lot of algorithms and more and more algorithms interacting in the system at the same time. And to illustrate what I want to say, I have a video here. Um, I hope the sound is going to pass. Uh, you tell me if not. So far, no sound, I think. Okay, so I can, I can, I can do the sound. So th these people actually are simple uh, agents using simple algorithms that is uh, called Q-learning, reinforcement learning, and they are just instructed to hide and seek. So they're learning to play hide and seek together. And what the video is illustrating here is that they learn to cooperate. So they learn to block here so that they cannot be found and they can not stay hidden here. Okay, so, but what happens is that after a certain number of, of learning iterations, also the people who have to find them, who are looking for them, learn how to bypass this, right? So this is an, a video from an open IA project. Um, and the bottom line here is that even for complex tasks, using simple machine learning algorithms like learning, which are the ones that we are going to use in this research here, is sufficient to make people cooperate. Now, going back to markets and economics, this is not a good news because in markets, in power markets in particular, um, cooperation is equivalent to collusion. And this is not good for two reasons. The first one is simply forbidden. And then the second one is supposedly to be forbidden, at least for human beings. Now, the second reason is that it destroys welfare, which drives me to uh, the main research questions. There is a bunch of literature today that is indeed testing the emergence of these algorithms in stylized and simplified versions of some markets, and they witness the emergence of collusive behaviors. So the algorithms learn to exert market power at quasi-collusive levels, which is a bad news. 
And what we wanted to do first in our research is to understand whether there is a concrete risk in more realistic markets. So they're going to have a, a setting that is more realistic than what you can find in the literature, focused on power markets um, and focused on smart operations of storage devices. And we focused on this because, as I said, this is, is the trend today, but it's also a, a, um, a problem that is more complex because it involves dynamic arbitrage in, in the storage and the behavior in the operations of the storage. So our question or is there a risk in realistic markets in complex markets applied to power markets? And the answer is yes, as you're going to see. Now, the second question was to look at the drivers of the collusion. What is making the algorithms learn to cooperate? As I said, there are some um, papers, and I'm going to tell you more about them later on, who are claiming that these algorithms are actually learning to deploy punishment strategies. So they're really learning to punish and to trigger price wars during a certain number of iterations and to punish any deviator from the collusive path. So we wanted to see whether in our more realistic setting, this was the case. And we really tried to see whether there are some punishment strategies or whether there are some other reasons, reasons that could explain the emergence of these collusive behaviors. And then finally, now, whether the behavior is caused by explicit punishment or due to something else, we really thought of some ways to regulate the system because this, the, the welfare can be destroyed even if the punishment strategies are not destroyed. Even if you observe for some reason that the algorithms are colluding, then you might want to regulate them to avoid welfare destructive effects. So we thought of certain, a certain number of efficient and, efficient and simple ways to regulate the algorithms to avoid that. This is an overview of the literature that is linked to our research. Um, first, you have all the literature around the digitalization of the energy and the electricity sector in particular. I'm thinking about smart grids, smart contracts, smart charging, smart electric vehicles, etc. Now, the second stream of literature is maybe more economic. These are all these people who have started to understand that despite the efficiency, the algorithms can harm social welfare. So either in trading activities or also in some systems recommendation of platforms where we have seen that there is an incentive to actually bias the recommendations for economic reasons. And maybe most importantly, there is all this economic literature that is burgeoning now, but the number of papers is quite small today. So I give you the most important ones. And these people here are trying to understand whether algorithms can collude and how you could regulate them and what are the drivers of regulation, exactly as we are trying to do in our paper for market powers. The most, uh, the one that is going to interest us today are the works of Calvano et al. Uh, because they claim in their setting that they have proof that people are or algorithms are deploying explicit punishment strategies. And then finally, there is the Cray literature um, that is going to look at the current regulatory framework we have, at least in Europe. And they all, all these papers agree on the fact that today we don't have the means to regulate these algorithms. We don't even have the means to test whether they are colluding or not because of the notion of explainability of algorithms, of responsibility of algorithms, et cetera. So there is definitely some regulatory work to be done to understand the drivers of pollution and how you should regulate these algorithms. This is the outline of my presentation. I will start by setting applied to power markets. Then I will talk more about the algorithms we're going to use, namely reinforcement learning and Q-learning. I'll show you our main results and you see that collusion can occur in these markets. And then we are going to look at the main drivers of collusion. We are going to try to see whether there are punishment strategies that are deployed or not. And then we are going to propose some regulation um, perspectives to, to tame collusion and mitigate market power before concluding. All right, let me start by the beginning. The main setting is inspired from the current situation of Tesla. You might know it already, but Tesla has been recently granted the license to trade electricity on EPEX spots. So basically, Tesla can sell and buy electricity from the markets. But we know that Tesla has a huge capacity. And maybe most importantly, Tesla, Tesla is also advertising on the use of, according to their website, a machine learning and operations learning algorithms joined together Seems that Ibrahim is blocked. Let's hope he comes back. Oh, no, he's offline. 
So let's hope he can come back in a minute or two. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, there was a connection issue, I think, Ibrahim. Ah, you're still muted. Sorry, can you see the slides? Not anymore, no. You were disconnected for five, ten seconds. Okay. Up. Now you tell me if you see the slides. Yes, but back in this mode that you also see the next one, not in the, the presenter mode. Yeah, perfect. Very good. Sorry about that. So as I said, the study is that there is a conjunction, at least for Tesla, between having a license to trade electricity on the market, having a huge storage capacity, and deploying algorithms to optimally operate the storage capacity. This is our settings. So we're going to look at France uh, for the example, and we consider that we have three Teslas, so three battery operators endowed with a certain capacity, and we assume here that the setting is asymmetric, which is not very important, but we, for more realism, we thought that it was better to have an asymmetric setting. But all these operators have the same energy to power ratio, we took it to 10 hours. If you do the math, you're going to notice that this corresponds roughly to having 60,000 Tesla electric vehicles of Model 3. And when you think that uh, only in 2020, roughly 200,000 electric vehicles were deployed in France, you are going to notice that this is quite conservative. These agents can trade electricity on the market, so they can sell and buy electricity on a typical winter day. So we're going to consider a typical interaction of 24 hours for a particular day. But these people have to treat with technical constraints linked to the operations of the battery. So there is a capacity constraint on the charging and discharging at each hour of the battery for each operator. And there is also a constraint on the total volume of electricity that can be stored in each battery at each hour. So there are these technical constraints that are standard in battery operations. <clears throat> each agent wants to maximize its profit and we assume that the producers of electricity are competitive. So they produce and sell electricity at the marginal cost, that is the fringe producers, to be able to satisfy the demand. And this demand is supposed to be elastic to the price. We're going to model a demand function here. We're going to treat three main standard benchmarks in economics um, and try to see in front of these how the algorithms are going to stand with respect to these benchmarks. So the first benchmark is the pure and perfect competition. People are price takers and they act competitively in the market for the 24 hours of the day. The second setting is the Nash Corner competition. In this setting, people are price maker. They exert market power because they know the demand function. They know the elasticity of the demand and they integrate it in their optimization program of the battery operations, right? But there is still competition. People are in competition. It's imperfect, but people do not communicate between themselves. And the third benchmark is the worst in terms of welfare. It's the cartel. It assumes that people are going to cooperate uh, and, and maximize their joint payoff. We're not going to say anything about how the joint payoff is going to be split, but we assume that the cartel is there and people are going to maximize their payoff um, jointly. And as I said, in front of this, we're going to simulate some Q learning algorithms and try to understand where they're going to stand with respect to these three benchmarks. Now, in terms of notation, this is the total quantity that is brought to the market. It depends on the production of the firms, sorry, of the fringe producers, but it also depends on the decisions of the battery operators, uh, whether they sell, whether they buy electricity from the market, uh, depending on their charging capacities and uh, to which uh, and what, what is the amount of trading activities in the market. So this is the total production or consumption in the market. The demand function is taken as linear. It's going to link the price to the volume. And these are the charging uh, constraints for the charging and discharging capacity, but also for the total uh, level of electricity that is available, available for each battery, for each time step, and for each agent here. Each agent is going to maximize its payoff, as I said. And what is new in our setting is that we consider the situation of what we call imperfect monitoring. Imperfect monitoring means that 
Initially, the algorithms know nothing about the market. They don't, do not know the elasticity of the demand. They will have to learn it, to learn it with learning. They do not know whether there are competitors in the market. They do not know whether there are other algorithms trading in the market. And most importantly, they cannot observe the decisions of the algorithms. Uh, otherwise, it's what we call perfect monitoring. Here, we assume that the algorithms only observe some aggregated market information. It's going to be the market price here. And based on the sole information, they have to learn how to operate optimally their batteries in the system in order to maximize their profit monitoring. All right, um, maybe some word on the kind of algorithms that we're going to use. As I said, these are reinforcement learning and key learning algorithms. Reinforcement learning is a, a specific kind, is you know, a specific set of algorithms where these algorithms are basically going to learn by doing. They observe a state of the system. So in our case, it's going to be the market price. And then they're going to try to play some actions. Initially, they know nothing. So they just try, they explore, and they see their immediate payoff. And they try to, concat to concatenate what we call the value function. So they just try to remember, given a state of the world and an action that has been taken, try to remember what is their expected payoff. So they're going to aggregate this information so is going to be the long-term discounted expected payoff that they're going to have for each set of action and each set of sorry state and action that they're going to see in the market. If you do that in a table, it's what we call the Q table. So this is basically Q learning and you should really see it as a table where you're going to list all the state and possible actions for each algorithm. And in front of this, you're going to find what we call the Q value or the value function. It's basically, again, the, your long-term expected payoff uh, discounted when you play this action for that state. So really one table for each algorithm. Uh, now, the main question is how you're going to fill this table. The algorithm is iterative. So the, there is an interaction between all the algorithms and the, uh, so Q-learning, sorry, is, is iterative. So there is an interaction between all the algorithms and the system. And basically each algorithm is going to see a state of the market, play an action according to a rule that I'm going to explain later on. Once the action is played, the algorithm is going to see the reward and collect the reward, update its Q matrix, and then the system moves to a new state. Okay, and then we iterate. So new state, new state that is observed, you play a new action, you collect new reward, you update your Q matrix, et cetera, and then it moves. And there is a continuous iteration between the algorithms and the system. Now, the way you update your Q matrix uh, is quite tricky. So if you are at state iteration N, if you are at state SN, and if you played action AN, what we are saying here is that the new value of the Q matrix at iteration N plus one, is going to be equal to a convex combination between the old value you had before, so not forget about your past experience, and the new value that you got. And this new value is like the value function in dynamic programming. So this is the immediate payoff you have, plus a discounted expected revenue that you're going to have after the iteration. So iteration at n plus one, when the system moves to the system n plus one, your Q matrix today tells you that the best you're going to earn is this one. You discount it, you add it to your immediate payoff, and then you do this comb combination here. And for all the other states and actions, you do not change the Q value that you, that you had. So basically this is how it works, the continuous interaction. Now, what remains to explain here is how you're going to play an action. So given a state, how the algorithm is going to play an action. And there is a trade-off here to be found between exploration and operations of the algorithm. Because if you are new in the market, if you want to learn about the market, then you need to explore a lot, initially, especially in the initial dates of the algorithm, because you know nothing about the market. You want to explore, explore randomly around the actions to fill your key matrix and to have the best representation of your expected payoff on the long term. But if you do that perfectly, then you're never going to converge. You're going to converge after a huge number of iterations. So there is a trade-off. And basically we do that in Q-learning by setting what we call an exploration rate. So with certain probability, when you see a state, you explore randomly in actions, in your set of actions with a certain probability. And with one minus that probability, you play your um, you know your optimal decision because you want to earn money at some point you're not just going to explore at some point you just say okay my q matrix for this state tells me to play this action which generates the highest payoff then i'm going to play that action to earn money 
And what we do usually in Q-learning to make the algorithms converge, as I said, quite quickly, is that you reduce this expiration race with iteration. So initially it's quite huge because quite big, quite equal to one, because you know nothing about the market you need to explore. And then you reduce that because you have better knowledge and then you operate your batteries like that. And then finally you end up with um, a setting where you have this market and these Q-learning agents are learning together. So you have to formulate an equilibrium between these Q-learning because there is, even if they don't communicate between themselves, there is um, a non-direct interaction between, an indirect interaction between these algorithms uh, simply because of the strategic interactions, for instance. The price is elastic. So each action that is taken by the algorithm is going to change the price. And then if you change the price, you change the payoff of all the other algorithms. So there is an indirect interaction that is going to occur here between the algorithms, despite the fact that they do not communicate between themselves. And the bad news is that in this setting here, you have absolutely no convergence results, right? You have um, nothing that can tell you um, um, that the algorithms are going to converge at the equilibrium or anything else. So this is why you have to resort to your numerical simulations to be able to, to say something about that. This is what I want to show you now. So what I want to show you are the main results here. I'm going to focus initially on one particular experiment. So we just let the algorithms learn, play during a certain number of iterations before convergence. And I'm going to focus on two main indicators. The first one is the total volume that is stored in the batteries in the system of the three agents, so the total volume that is stored. And then the second is going to be the evolution of the market prices with the number of hours of the day. I also report the three benchmarks that I told you about that are uh, here. So what we see, what you see here is that in the initial early stages of the algorithm, of the algorithms of learning, the algorithms know nothing about the market, so they take quite inefficient actions. The Q matrix is initialized to zero, so they don't know how to play, they just explore randomly, which leads to quite low payoffs and something that looks like you know rubbish. If you wait a little bit, you're going to see algorithms taking actions that start look to something realistic. You see the two bumps here that you're going to have during your day that uh, start to appear. If you wait a little bit longer, it's more realistic. So here we are really, really seeing the algorithms learning more and more about the market and learning how to operate the batteries so that to increase their profit and to do something that is sensible. And then finally, after convergence, which is what is interesting for us, you start seeing the Q learning algorithm that is shown here ranging somewhere between the Cournot competition and the Cartel competition. So, and if you look at only also the market prices, almost in every hour here, the Q-learning algorithms are going to provide prices that range between the Cournot price and the Cartel price. So the first conclusion here for this particular experiment is that market power can be learned at least like that so we're not talking about the drivers but they can be learned to be exerted by the algorithms at levels that are higher and in a lot of simulations much higher than we, what you find in the Kurno and quite close to the cartel situations now to quantify a little bit things um, so we run a lot of simulations because there is some noise in the learning process so we have some confidence interval in the results here that i'm showing here um, and we report on the evolution of the social welfare and the industry profits with the iterations, with the learning iterations of the algorithm. So this is learning here. And then when see, things do not move a lot, this is what we call convergence. We assume that the algorithms have converged. So for both the industry profits and for the social welfare, you see that the algorithms learn to exert market power and they finally are going to converge somewhere between the cartel and the corner interactions and the Nash Gorno equilibrium. And in a lot of iterations, in a lot of settings, actually it is quite close and very close to the cartel. And to quantify how close you are to the cartel, we define what we call the welfare loss. It's basically a distance between, in the welfare between your welfare after convergence with Q learning and the Gorno welfare. It ranges between zero and one. If it's zero, it means that you are at the Nash Gorno equilibrium. If it is equal to one, it means that you are the cartel. And if it's the higher, then the more market power you have, the more cartel you are. You, you are. And for this basic setting here, you have um, you know, a welfare loss of 0.4. Uh, it's going to serve as a benchmark because we're going to compare this one to the other welfare losses we have for other settings. 
The result is very ro robust. If you play with a lot of hyperparameters of the algorithms, for instance, if you delay the learning process of some agents, if you play with the symmetry assumption of the agents, then you still end up in a situation of quasi cartel So at least somewhere between the Cournot and the cartel which is indeed quite worrying. This- Raim, Could you do yeah. in a couple of more minutes, maybe maximum four or five? Okay, very good. Um, Five minutes. Okay, thank you. The second research question was, is this collusion? So you remember I told you that Calvano is um, suspecting their algorithms to uh, behave, at least in their setting, like punishing algorithms. And to test this, they just simulate a deviation. So once the algorithms have converged, they just simulate a deviation of one algorithm and they and then they see how the other algorithms are going to react and as i said uh, it looks like a price war so algorithms try to bid aggressively in the market they decrease the short-term payoffs before going back to the collusive track we wanted to see whether this was a plausible explanation in our case so we also simulated deviations from the collusive path to see whether there are some punishment or not. So if you simulate a pro-competitive deviation, which is what we call a free riding opportunity, right? And this is what basically prevents the cartel from, um, in theory at least, from uh, appearing in the market because there is always an incentive to sell a little bit more than the others and, and to make the system converge to the Nash equilibrium. So when you simulate this, it indeed appears here, you can see it, that there is a punishment. It looks like a punishment because the immediate payoffs are quite low. Now, the problem is that even if you simulate deviations in the other direction that are supposed to be rewarded because they bring the system closer to the national, to the cartel situation, so it's the pro-collusive move, it's also punished. So there seems to be a blind punishment and we're not very comfortable with it. So we try to come up with an alternative explanation of this phenomenon. And it turns out, at least in our setting, that this is due actually to a bad exploration or an imperfect exploration policy that is a kind of systematic in Q-learning algorithms, at least in realistic settings. You cannot wait a huge number of iterations to make the algorithms learn everything. And basically what we say here, because of this feature, the algorithms do not learn how to free ride. They just become locked in or trapped in the collusive path. They, at some point, they try collusion simultaneously. They see good payoffs. And then in the nature of Q-learning, there is it's in the nature of Q-learning to reinforce this bias. And they regularly come back to this and they stay trapped in this collusive group. And they simply do not learn how to provide them just to deviate a little bit more to, because when they do this, something that they do not, do not explore, they do not test. And to challenge this explanation, we make them explore. Um, so if you have some questions, happy to answer this. And it turns out that it explains quite well. So when we just try to help the algorithms learn to free write on the collusive behavior, only during learning, so we just intervene during learning, and then we leave them live their life afterwards. Then we see the system converging towards the uh, equilibrium, the Nash Cono equilibrium, which is quite good news. All right, I'm not going to talk about regulation because I don't have time, but we have indeed thought of some ways to regulate the market. Maybe two words here decentralization of algorithms, it works like in human beings. And then uh, maybe an, a benevolent agent, a regulator, or a TSO who owns also battery, but he doesn't maximize welfare, he just implement a simple reward punishment strategy. And both are quite good actually because they bring the system closer to the national equilibrium and far away from the cartel. All right, to conclude, um, we've done all this uh, for power markets, realistic settings, um, in perfect monitoring. And we also see that despite the absence of communication and the complexity to, in theory, collude, algorithms learn to collude quite quickly. It is even by using simple algorithms like Q-learning. Um, we, we dip a little bit further. We try to see whether these are due to punishment strategies. It is not the case, actually, in our setting. It's due to the imperfectness of learning that is inherent to the nature of Q learning and reinforcement learning usually. And then finally, we also, and then if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We also discuss on ways to regulate the market um, and some yeah, quite heavy or less heavy handed ways to regulate the market and bring the system closer to competition. Thank you and sorry for all the problems. Thank you, Ibrahim. I think uh, incredibly interesting presentation. So now we, we can open the floor for, for questions. I see that uh, Nicola already has uh, raised his hand. So Nicola, please go for it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tim. And uh, thanks a lot, Ibrahim. Like, very interesting work. I'm really happy I'm finally get to see it. Uh, I heard 
valid for a while and I haven't seen it yet. So I'm, I'm super excited about it. Um, two Thank questions. Um, one, um, so you're, you're in the situation where the state space seems very simple in a way. You just have one day and, and still you need like over 1 million uh, running iter iteration to converge. So, I mean, uh, do you think that there is a possibility in a, in a real life setting where the state space is more complicated and non stationary? Um, you may end up in a situation where exploration is just not worth it and you just convert to something that is closer to Nash or at least less collusive as what you see. Uh, and then I have a more minor question, which is like you take a, a, an energy to duration, an energy to power ratio of like 10 hours, which is much uh, bigger than the power rule, which is two hours, I think. So basically it means that the only constraint that is binding is a power constraint. So it, does it change something? Is there, is there a photo duration? I guess not, but I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Nicola. Um, yeah, so th these are two actually excellent questions. For this, I start by the minor one. You, yeah, I agree. So it's it, 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 um, at least twice more than what you see for the power wall, for instance. Uh, I, I think the, the highest you find in these devices are seven or eight hours. Uh, but we've also tested other um, uh, other energy to power ratios, and it's 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 still the same. So it's quite robust with respect to that. Now, regarding the first question, which is uh, fundamental, um, I we have to test. Um, but what is happening usually when you talk to traders is that they have basically one algorithm per typical typical day, right? So they 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 might have 30, uh, 365 algorithms, for instance, each one for each day, and then they run them, and they just rerun each the time. So it's it, it complexifies the problem, but if you have an algorithm that is quite uh, fit to the day that you are describing, assuming that the drivers have not changed, but when I agree that this is a strong assumption because of all the renewable generation, for instance, but assuming that stationarity is lost, but not that lost, then it, it can work if you just multiply the number of algorithms you're gonna have. But I agree with you, um, we have to test it. So basic, obviously we're not going just to simulate the whole year and the battery for the whole year because it won't be possible, but it's the good way to test it is to have some noise actually in, in, the, um, in the system or the market price that you are going to receive because of the non-stationarity. And we try to see whether the algorithms are quite robust with respect to that. We did some simulations already, and it seems indeed that the algorithms are not quite robust with respect to noise. And when you look at the literature, Q-learning has this problem. When you learn, um, if you have some noise, then um, you're going to take quite inefficient decisions and the cartel is going to be broken. This is why we are in this in ongoing research. We are also testing other kinds of algorithms like neural networks um, and soft actor critic uh, models and it's that are more robust, famous to be more robust with respect to noise. Um, and we're, it's still ongoing research, but it's, it's definitely something that we have to try. I agree. Yeah, and maybe a follow-up, because I, I agree you could split day, but then you will lack like opportunity to experiment because I don't know if one type of day occurs 10 times a year, then you need the century to have. <laughs> yeah, but you can, but, but I agree with you, but what the traders do it is train them out of the market and then put them on job. So they train them out of the market using, you know, uh, fundamental modeling, uh, combined with past data and then they put them so you don't start from scratch so you still have you operate in the market okay so i think there was are there any other questions because we got to keep it short and in about two minutes we got to go to the next session in the chat, there was maybe a, a short question from from uh, Professor Green about 100% efficient batteries. Yeah, well, more of a comment. Your perfect competition gives you almost perfectly flat prices, yeah. which would lose money if you had re if you wanted to have realistic batteries. And referees might insist on it, so give them what they want. Okay, okay, that's that's indeed a good point. I, I totally agree, and this is why we have flat prices. Indeed, uh, I, I totally agree with that. Okay, so I think we, we can end this first presentation here. Um, I, will, I liked it uh, a lot and I think uh, it's very innovative looking forward on how these approaches will evolve. So now over to Eric Hellman, please. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I think I can share the slides. Yes, you see my presentation? I think so. Perfect, yes. Okay. So thank you very much. My presentation is on forecast of high frequency energy data based on machine learning applications. And in this session of market modeling, I do not focus on prices or behavior, but only on um, the forecast of uh, energy data, in particular electricity data. And in, uh, sorry, in comparison with the um, presentation before, I think we go a step back and I want to give an somehow an introduction to the concept of machine learning because I think most of uh, economists are somehow familiar with the term but only maybe only have a rough idea and I um, want to bring into connection machine learning with classical modeling of time series and hope uh, to get a basic understanding for everyone. So this is the first part of my presentation, a short introduction into this concept of machine learning. And the second part is a short case study on um, electricity forecast of small to medium companies of in, in Germany. So let's start with a short motivation. I think it's clear that forecasts are an important topic in energy economics. There are lots of applications for short-term and long-term forecasts and uh, lots of techniques that can fulfill these applications. But what we can observe is that new use cases, for example, local balancing of electricity requires forecasts with a high temporal and local resolution. And this high temporal and local resolution leads to a big amount of data that has to be processed. And uh, I think machine learning can provide forecasts for this big data application. And um, because uh, it's uh, machine learning is state of the art, but it's state of the art more in the technical oriented literature and not so in the economic or oriented literature. Um, although we heard a very good presentation before that proves the opposite. But uh, I think these are some, some uh, niches here. So I want to start with a short introduction, what machine learning is. And machine learning is brought into connection often with terms like artificial intelligence and applications like language recognition, uh, picture recognition, autonomous driving, and so on. And in fact, all these applications are out of the uh, field of machine learning. So when you look into the literature, you won't find a very general definition what machine learning actually means. And I want to point out two points that I think are the most important characteristic of machine learning models. And uh, these are the first, the first is um, machine learning models are always based on experience. So you need input data. So it's a concept out of the data science. And the second is that the model needs a task this, that is measurable. For example, with an error term um, or something like that, we saw in the presentation before the Q matrix that is basically a measure of the task that should be fulfilled. And this task can be of various kind. We have, for example, prediction, classification, clustering, and um, only on, on high level here. And if we talk about the forecast of energy data, we talk about prediction. I think that's clear. And the data, so the input here can be labeled or unlabeled typically. And we're talking here about labeled data because the label of this data is the actual true value of our energy that we want to forecast. So with this rough picture of a machine learning model, I think, um, every data-based model can be interpreted as machine learning and somehow, for example, an easy linear regression could be a machine learning model. And this is the first thing I want to point out here that in fact, uh, machine learning in, in my view is not a cluster of different models, but it's a type of modeling concept. And this is what I uh, want to show in this slide. Um, the process of machine learning modeling. 
Um, we start, as I already said, with an, an labeled data set here, and we will uh, divide this data set into test data, validation data, and training data. And we do so because we want a very standardized modeling process in the following manner. At first, we define a model approach. So uh, the basic model we want to use and hyperparameters for a grid search. And these hyperparameters um, contain different specifications for this model approach. And then we follow this modeling cycle by training the model with the training data, then measure the performance with the validation data, and then store the performance and begin with the next set of hyperparameters. And this, um, this process leads to a best model for the selected data, and then can be evaluated for the on the test data. It's important to use test data that are not involved in the modeling process itself, because this could influence the selection of the data. So I think the main difference between um, machine learning and a classical modeling gets clear in this picture. We have a highly standardized and therefore highly automated um, way in selecting a model in contrast to a manual model selection that follows maybe a economic literature or something. Uh, or an idea that I have about the model and then testing something manually, this machine learning process is highly automated on an, and can be on an arbitrary um, size of searching. And I think it's an advantage to do such a high automatization, but it has only a disadvantage because this process can lead to unexpected model selection. Um, maybe a model can then not be interpreted because it has a parameterization that is not as I expect from the literature or something. Okay, this to the modeling process. Now I want to lose some words on the application on energy demand data. As I already said, the model test in such a case is, every, uh, is a prediction and the target data is the energy data, of course. And as input data, we can use past energy data points. That means we use past values of these energy data to explain the future energy data. We can use the timestamp, for example, what day of the week or what hour of the day. Of course, I think that's intuitive and we can use weather data or any other exploratory data. Um, what is very important in this connection, and I also think this is intuitive, is that it's uh, important to think about the time uh, we want to forecast, so the forecast horizon. And uh, the easy case is we're only doing a static forecast for the next time step of our model. And this is easy because we then have all the information um, our model needs uh, because we are in this, we are in the time that um, T0 T0 <laughs> is and every uh, input is already given. When we go further in the, into the future, maybe the model needs some um, endogenous variables, for example, the energy demand itself, in order to uh, take the prediction of the future. For example, um, the last energy time step, uh, the last the, the, the energy of the last time step will be used as, as explanatory for the next time step. And this is endogenous from the uh, model. Why do I say this? Um, you can build a very good fitted model that you that provides very good static uh, forecast. And then you do this, for example, for a 24 hour forecast and have such high error terms here. This is an, a danger of modeling and you should define what kind of forecast do you want before you model. This is, in principle, it's a task that you define for the model. Okay, I think it's uh, relatively in intuitive, but maybe you will forget if you uh, apply such a model. After these uh, general words, I will come to our case study. We did a case study to compare three different approaches with different complexity. 
And we wanted to compare different input data complexity for these approaches. And we did not use any new approach or develop any new approach. And we, but uh, use state of the art approaches. And we also did not optimize these approaches um, above the grid search I already mentioned. So our data set were uh, hourly electricity demand of 42 business consumers and one residual demand on the uh, transformer of the electricity network. Um, all these 42 consumers were in the same geographical area. So we had also numerical weather prediction data for this area with 27 different features. So our input data were the timestamp, um, the weather data, and up to four past values of the target data. And with these input data, we formed a full input data set with 35 exogenous variables and a reduced input data set with only five exogenous variables. And we evaluated our three models. I will come to in a second um, on the normalized root mean square and error for a static forecast and the dynamic forecast of 24 hours. Um, which models did we choose with which approaches? Uh, I don't want to go into detail here. I think there these uh, models are more or less good uh, documented literature. The first is Arimax, a classical time series analysis model that basically uh, models a linear relationship between the past values of the energy demand and the future values and the exogenous variables. Uh, the second is artificial neural networks. That's one of the most common uh, approaches in the field of machine learning and linear and nonlinear relationship between target and input variables. And the, sec uh, the third auto LSTM is a advancement of ANNs and it's out of the field of deep learning and models uh, even more um, nonlinear relationship and is designed especially for dynamic forecasts. So it doesn't um, provide a static forecast for only one time step. This slide um, um, summarizes our case study. As we see in this picture here, it follows the uh, machine learning process I already introduced. And we modeled in some 285 prediction models for these. 443 uh, target data sets. And this is the overview on the results. Um, I will slow down a little bit because these uh, pictures are some uh, are very big. We have in this axis the different target data sets, load data and here the residual data and in this axis the different models and side by side for every um, model the static and the dynamic forecast and the darker the, the color of this color map the better was the model performance and this is the test model performance for every model here and we see here the auto LSTM does only have a dynamic forecast no static so what we see, what we can see in this picture are two uh, main points. The first is we can identify very good fitted models. For example, this dark line here or here and very poor fitted models, which is for example, this or for example, this, what means poor and good. Uh, good is maybe between five and 10% here and um, bad is between 20 and 40 percent error term in each case. Um, the worst, the worst value was about 50 percent error term, and this is really bad forecast. I think it means on average we fail the true value with 50 percent of this, of the value. Um, the second thing we can see is a pattern between the static and the dynamic forecast. This is what I already mentioned. We have in general a, a good or a better static forecast, but if we look 24 hours into the future, we have some higher error terms here. And I think the dynamic forecast is the most relevant case because typically we need a day ahead forecast of something. And this is why we now look into these dynamic forecasts in detail. 
we have here a box plot of the um, dynamic forecast results, but not only the test results, but also the train results of every um, model. On the left side, we see the models with the complete input data. And on the right side, we see the models with the reduced input data. And I want to point out three, I think, interesting things here. The first is um, the relationship between train and input results. I already, already teased it. Um, we see in the nonlinear models, especially here in ANN models and auto LSTM models, uh, the train results are better than the test results. And in the, in the uh, extreme case here, the train results of the auto LSTM with complete input has the best, on average, the best results. But on the test case, the worst. So this underlines what I already said. We, you should always use test data that are not involved in the modeling process itself. Because if you do so, you may get a uh, false uh, understanding of how good your model actually is. So what's interesting is that for the linear models, the Arimax, um, this relationship is the other way around. So we have a better fitting in the test set than in the train set. And to be honest, I cannot fully um, understand why this is the case in this in our case study. Um, the next point I want to point out is that none of the three approaches outperforms the others. If we look at the test set here, 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 and here, they are more or less in the in on average in the same dimension. And if we you look into detail, you will find that every uh, uh, approach is for at least one data set the best approach for our case study. And the last thing also very interesting um, is that we cannot see a, a improvement of performance with a complete input data in relation to the reduced input data. So um, in contrast for the auto LSTM we see that with complete input data the um, performance on the tested is worse than with the reduced input data. Okay, so I already come to the conclusion. What have we learned from all of this? The first point is um, machine learning is a process of modeling that is data-based and um, aims on a measurable target. And this process can be applied to different model approaches, even to classical model approaches as it is Arimax or something like this. And our case study suggests that there's no general relationship between high model complexity and good model performance and no general relationship between a high input data set uh, and good model performance. Nevertheless, this is strongly depends on the structure of the data and the amount of the data. So it could be, uh, we, all, we, we had here a, a one year data set hourly. So 8,760 data points. That's in the measure of machine learning, not very much. If you had three years or maybe 10 years of data, then the advantages of very complex nonlinear models could be uh, more visible. And so it is always worth to, uh, try different models and if you need a good forecast and select the one that performs best on your data set. And the last message I want to send is these, the, the models we applied are more or less black box models. The linear approach a little less black box and the nonlinear a little more black box. There are techniques to understand even the more linear, uh, the, the, the nonlinear machine learning approaches and look into um, some causality between input and output, but these are highly complex. And for a, a beginner in this topic, um, you can say if you need a understanding of relationship, then just need more linear models. And if you only need a good forecast, then you can also use um, 
nonlinear models that may be hard to interpret, but you have a good forecast in the best case. Okay, with this, I want to come to an end and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Eric. Very nice uh, presentation on, on an exploration of these, these different models and how good they could work to forecast the uh, load, energy load data. So now we'd open the, the floor for questions. So please, the ones who want to ask a question, open your camera and, um, or you raise your hands so you can, you can pose your question. So, okay, I think for now there are no questions, but I, I have some. So what, what you show in, in your conclusion is that actually these more complex models uh, do not necessarily perform better and the more data you input do not, does not let necessarily improve the result. Um, I mean, if you would apply these type of, of algorithms to other types of time series, not uh, electricity consumption, then these, I mean, these, let's say, uh, almost truths of machine learning, they would hold, right? Because the more you give, the better it performs. So why? Is 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 it specific to to electricity load data that is so so complicated to do this? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure if we had a maybe too short time series to to show that more data, more input data, lead to better um, to better understanding of the structure of data, or maybe we used the, the wrong explanatory data. So, as, so we used only only um, weather and the timestamp basically and the time series itself. So, and, and um, the main difference between the reduced and the full input data set is that we throw away very lot of the weather data and had only the temperature, I think, and maybe the radiance, I'm not entirely sure, but, um, if you have other explanatory data, um, for example, uh, I don't know, um, some production data of a company or something like this, this can, of course, um, lead to a better model performance if you have this. I think maybe our, our input data are also very correlated or maybe also ir irrelevant for the model. And this can also lead to such a um, result as we have seen that the reduced input performs way uh, better a little bit or uh, in the same dimension as the, as the complete input. And what I want to uh, send here, the message I want to send here is that maybe if you don't have such an amount of data you can also take what you have and uh, feed a simple model. And these results can be um, a good first step, for example. And if you then get more data, better data, uh, not only more in a sense of a longer time, but more in a sense of um, more qualitative data or something, then you can improve your model. Okay, uh, thank you. So there's a question from, Ibrahim. Yes, yes, thank you, Eric, for, for the talk. So at the end, you said, you talked about the kind of black box phenomenon of these machine learning algorithms, and you said that like linear, simple linear models or regressions are maybe less of a black box than the others. Do you have, and I know that it's complicated, but do you have any way, do you know of any way to quantify this, to say that this is a black box model and this one is maybe more explainable than the other? Um, do you know of any research in, in that or any papers that we can read? Uh, very, very nice question. I fear I have no good answer for you, but if you uh, would like to, I can um, connect you to my co-author, Janos, and he's more an expert in this uh, data science stuff. And I think one of his, um, one of his focus in, in his PhD is how to interpret such very um, complex models. If you'd like to, I can connect you. Yeah, yeah, we'd be happy. Thank you. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, then we have one more question from Liliana. Yeah, uh, just a short question. That was a very interesting uh, presentation, but I wanted to ask, because you said that you can also add qualitative data. So how do you think you can add qualitative data for this model? Um, to be honest, I don't have a good example. It, it depends on what you what information you have and Um, qualitative could could be, for example, um, if you have a, a, a very, very basic example, you have a um, um, day without work, something. Um, what is what is yeah, attack? Rather than example, like how uh, my question is about implementation, like mm -hmm. where in the in your model that could fit? Um, you would use a binary variable as input that maybe okay, just is binary. Okay. okay. For example, could okay. do some. Okay. Yes. This, I would. I would try so. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think Ibrahim's hand is still raised, but I think it was from the previous question. Unless he has a follow up, otherwise, no, no, I we don't will have. To. Okay. So. I maybe just one little question, Eric. Um, like the the fact that some of these more complex models do not necessarily perform better, and that there's a big difference between training and testing. Does that I mean means you're overfitting, right? So, yes. um, did you try some techniques to somehow correct this this overfitting and punishing terms, or or how does that work? Yes, in fact, we did. Um, the the extreme case was the auto LSTM, and in fact, this is the corrected version of the auto LSTM. The first version was um, even more bad uh, in in testing performance, and then we. Um, but I'm I'm not the the expert in this model too. It, it was also Janosch, and uh, yes, we we somehow um, fixed it out and now it's um, in the same performance range as the other models but it's still our our first hypothesis uh, hypothesis was that um, the very nonlinear model should perform better than the others and the first try was no it's it performs worse on this data and this was somehow um, uh, bad for the story <laughs> but um, it, it was the result and now we have at least that these models work in a similar range and yeah it's it's uh, some I, I don't want to, to repeat here it depends on the data you use on the amount of data and the results here suggest it can lead even to a bad performance if you use very complex models if you overfit as you already said yeah. so watch out and keep it simple so. yeah. keep it simple is one uh, key message here okay thank you very much so now thank we you. go over to the to the third presentation of, of this session from liliana novakova from um, empirical uh, college with now uh, she's going to present the paper together with richard green uh, about and, and the title is spotted identifying the drivers of the british uh, electricity spot prices so the floor is yours thank you uh hello everyone my name is liliana and i'm the phd student at imperial college london and this is uh, our joint work with my supervisor richard Wynn. And we produced a paper called Spotted How Varying Fuel Prices Affected British Electricity Wholesale Prices. Uh, so as an introduction, I will present the general goals and motivation behind this project. Then I will give a quick overview of the UK energy market and some background uh, in general. And I will also briefly remind everyone the theory behind the merit order effect as it will be crucial uh, for our methodology that will follow together with results. So in general, in this paper, we research uh, wholesale electricity prices. And for that, we conducted the ex post study of the British day ahead spot prices for almost a decade. I'm not sure, but we still see your first slide. Huh? 
sorry? That we're still seeing your first slide. I don't know. Oh, really? That's, yeah. I don't know what to do. Let me maybe stop sharing and I will do this again. Yeah, now it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no idea what happened. So we okay. probably missed, sorry, uh, the second one. So that's the second one. Um, okay, so uh, we are doing this because, first of all, we want to test new methodology to capture varying fuel prices. Uh, so that later and ultimately we want to understand the factors driving electricity prices so that later we can measure the effect of different policies on electricity market, uh, like, for example, the UK carbon, carbon regulation. So in general, we want to understand the most crucial drivers of the price curve to understand why the British prices rose by 22% from 2009 to 2017. And we found this particularly interesting as during the time the renewable generation grew significantly in UK, while the demand uh, substantially decreased. And what is more, uh, we found that actually so far at least, uh, there are no detailed uh, studies with such a long span performed for the British market. So now let's quickly recap some basic rules of electricity market. So at the wholesale level, generators submit bids to the energy market, the pool where electric power is being traded. And power pools are established to promote competition between generators. Generators bid according to the prices at which they want to operate. And in the spot uh, market, the price is set and the point, uh, of course, where the supply curve crosses the estimated demand. And the price is called also the spot price, which is the price set for the whole system. And of course, in a perfectly competitive market, as you all probably know, prices would reflect their marginal costs. But in fact, in reality, so what we have, the outturn prices are highly dependent on energy demand and some other factors which we aim to investigate here. So modeling electricity prices uh, is kind of a tricky task. And one thing that adds to complexity is that this commodity is not storable. And it gets even more complicated as, um, you know, let's consider different kinds of generators in one pool. So we have renewables, which are fairly cheap, but not always uh, available. Contrary to fossil fuels, which are expensive, uh, but not flexible, but also in general, we can say they are quite reliable. And in the UK, comparing the beginning and the end of our research period, that is, uh, let's say, uh, 2009 to 2018, we can see that there was a dramatic growth in renewable generation, both for solar and wind as well. And here it's worth to note that, uh, of course, we have yearly averages here, but clearly the output is not so uh, stable. It's much, much more volatile. And for example, if we take average of weekly or daily averages, we can see that the volatility, especially for wind, is, is very high indeed. So in general, we can describe wholesale electricity prices as rather unpredictable, volatile, but definitely essential for all market participants. And the major factors driving this volatility in prices are changes in fuel and carbon prices, volatility in energy demand, and definitely also unstable, uh, as we can see, renewable generation. And this is really problematic as volatility brings uncertainty to energy suppliers about their costs and, of course, thus also about their final revenues. So now let's briefly discuss the literature review. So uh, in different papers, there are various regional price drivers, uh, but the biggest factor remained actually common and happened to be nothing else that than the growth of renewable um, generation, which had the biggest depressing impact on price. Uh, 
uh, especially the very popular paper I think here is the one by here from 2018. Uh, also interesting findings were discovered in the Bushnell and Novan paper, where authors actually found that there are two patterns in uh, how the price responds to increase of renewable generation. So the study was for California market, and we can see that during the day when there is actually abundance of solar power, the price tended to decrease compared to other days. But in the evening, where the sun is no longer there, actually the average price of electricity tended to increase even compared to the historical benchmark. So this tells us that actually the impact of renewables uh, is not on average so clear that we would expect as it's, it is very region specific. And also that uh, we have a market power and the growing renewable generation may indeed lower the production costs, but not necessarily the price of electricity. And another important factor is the, uh, the cost of carbon emissions. So <clears throat> in paper by Fabra, uh, she discusses the market power of power companies. So uh, basically the um, passing the cost of emission to electricity prices which she explains by the restricted demands, uh, elasticity, and also lack of the price constraints. And what we could, what we could learn from all these papers is uh, that definitely they're all using the direct fuel approach, the direct fuel prices. And uh, mainly they are, they are based on um, investigating gas prices. And we may think that actually, given the rapidly changing capacity mix, this may be subject to an upgrade. And here we can see the case uh, of the mode order where here on this graph, uh, we see that gas is indeed the price setter in this case. So in general, the merit order principle of operation means that the stations with the lowest marginal costs tend to produce um, the most power of the, over the year, but actually these higher cost stations, which are on the margin, are producing less, but they are setting the price in the spot market, as you can see here. And during our research period, the British power sector had large amount of both gas and coal uh, fired stations, at least for most of, of the research period. And the relative fuel costs uh, largely determined which type of stations were used more intensively. So as we can see on the right hand side, when the gas price is relatively high, it will, sorry, it will tend to affect the electricity price uh, at peak times. And as seen on, on the picture as well, uh, when the gas price is relatively low or the carbon price is high, because that also may be the case, gas prices will have stronger influence on the off-peak prices than the coal gas. And here we can see the changing electricity prices, the red line, together with the fuel costs throughout our whole research period. Uh, it's worth to know that our <clears throat> fuel costs already have embedded the carbon costs here as well. Uh, what's interesting here is to know that we can differentiate basically three different periods. So we have two periods of or trends of increasing electricity price. This is the first one, and this is the second one. But in the middle, it occurred that actually there was a trend of decreasing electricity prices. Also, what's interesting here to note is that, let's say in the last couple of years, the coal, the black line, occurred to be the more expensive fuel, mainly, of course, due to the carbon pricing. But at the same time, please note that there is a significant drop in the share of the output of the coal here. And here we present all six energy sources as a, as a share of the total generation over each year. 
And as we can see, the renewables experienced a significant growth over the years, contributing only around 4% here and then growing up to 30% here. Also, the share of the coal was around 30% in the first year and then increased uh, in 2012 up to even 44%, but only to dramatically decrease uh, to in 2018 to up to 5%. So that's, we can expect that the, the growing coal prices in the recent years may have dragged the price up in the merit order stack, but this phenomenon may not have actually such significant impact given the little contribution the coal actually has here. And finally, methodology. So we want to capture this switching different fuel prices by constructing variables of uh, cost of gas generation and of coal generation per se. But we want to capture uh, which, whichever is cheaper and whichever is more expensive. So we'll call the new variables cheaper fuel and costlier fuel. So very, very straightforward. And additionally, we introduce nonlinear relationship <clears throat> between uh, demand and our price by using polynomials. As for the data is concerned, so we used um, different uh, data from different kinds of sources, but basically we use health hourly data from, from the they had market in UK. Uh, and we got the data from InsoE of Jam Bloomberg or investing.com. So why not linear? Why we use polynomials in our model? So first of all, we chose the model with nonlinear relationship of demand towards price as our main specification, as we suspect this relationship actually to be much more complex than the linear one. And firstly, to check if our assumptions of nonlinearity is correct, we run the model without any interaction effects to actually see clearly the relationship between demand and the price. And the coefficient actually occurred to be statistically significant, uh, mainly I mean for the demand squared and demand cubed in this case which may mean that the positive sign for the demand and negative sign for the demand squared uh, we can suggest that there is a monotonic increasing function of price until there is a turning point, and then it very slightly turns upward. Uh, so let's see our variables that we use in our model. So there are two kinds of variables. First of all, uh, there is a set of the data we found and we directly incorporated in our model. So there is, for example, like price, demand, capacity. So it's, it's very straightforward. But also there is a whole set of variables that we created and calculated for our purposes. So for example, each day we worked out which fuel is cheaper and which is most more costlier. Of course, each fuel has embedded as well carbon costs and is adjusted for the thermal efficiency already. Uh, and also we have cheap capacity, which is basically the capacity of the cheaper fuel that is currently cheaper at each hour. Uh, and then we calculated cost or demand, which is basically the demand that is not satisfied by this cheap fuel we found. So finally, our model. So as I said, uh, we actually have two approaches. So here, the baseline standard model, uh, the linear one that exploits the direct uh, fuel prices, the gas price and the coal price in this case, and also our model, which incorporates the switching between the types of fuels uh, based on its relative price, that is cheaper fuel and costlier fuel. Additionally, here, as I said, we introduced squared and cubed values of demand in order to check for 
any turning points in the relationship uh, with demand. And in both specifications here, the dependent variable is the half hourly price of electricity. And um, yeah, the V vector uh, contains the dummy for the peak hours, as well as the interaction effects of uh, prices with demand. So here we quickly present the coefficients for the final model with polynomials. But of course, I am aware that it is not straightforward to, to have some idea out of it. So instead of describing each parameters, uh, we decided to present graphs. So here we have graphs showing the marginal impact of fuel prices uh, on price for different levels of demand in both our models. So here we have direct uh, fuels approach and the switching fuel approach on the right. So let's firstly discuss this one. So we can see that the coal has quite stable uh, impact on price regardless of the demand, which may be explained by uh, coal generators not being flexible and simply unable to change their outputs uh, promptly with growing demand. We also uh, acknowledge that uh, this impact may be actually different for different years, but we were, we were forced to uh, average things out in our model. And here we have gas as well. So gas, on the other hand, changes its marginal impact uh, and grows significantly, especially when it passes the 45 gigawatt threshold here. And that high value actually uh, may be caused by the, by the need of burning more fuel. That is, for example, when plants are less thermally efficient when running close to uh, their maximal capacity. And on the right, uh, we can see the marginal impact uh, on, of fuels on the price uh, in our fuel switching uh, polynomial model. And we can see that the marginal impact um, of cheap fuel actually goes even uh, close to zero when the demand uh, is in the, in the area of 40 or 45 gigawatts. And that may indicate that, uh, for example, when um, right now the expensive fuels are on the margin. So basically the cheap fuel is running um, anyway at the unchanged level and basically the cheaper fuel is not affecting the price in such case at least that's our explanation for that and this is what's what's really interesting here is that we performed several counterfactual calculations setting um, various elements of the data to their uh, 2009 values and using the regression equation, uh, we estimated the resulting electricity prices. So let's have a look. For example, for some factors like the EU carbon price or demand, uh, we know that actually the values in 2009 were bigger than, than later. Um, also, we repeat this process one at a time and uh, in, this, in this way, we produce this graph, which is based on the annual average prices. And what we can see here is actually that more renewables and less demand would have reduced the prices, but the fuel prices went up and also the, the UK carbon price went up significantly, even more than the European carbon emission price went down. So in general, um, we have where we have with the, with the increased prices, but there's also one thing to be mind here that of course the impact could be much more bigger but uh, due to the interaction effects, but um, mm, we get uh, we get this graph only by changing one thing at a time. And also uh, for the sake of comparisons and further understanding, 
we performed the what if analysis uh, with different case scenarios based on our switching fuel model with cubic demand variables. And we wanted to make predictions for the year 2017 as it was the last one in our research period. So the what if analysis clearly shows that, for example, demand, which decreased uh, quite significantly even over the years, uh, actually contributed to the drop in average electricity price by around, let's say, 10%. Then we checked for carbon. So at the same time, carbon uh, increased significantly uh, and also affected that the final price uh, increased significantly here as well. We also checked for the change in the basic fuel price, which also contributed significantly to the increase of the final electricity price, but also only around, let's say, 10%. So basically, we can say that actually the impact of fuels offsets the impact of the decreased demand in this case. And finally, the renewables. So the last important factor. And we can see uh, the growing output of renewables and like growing significantly also had quite significant impact on decreasing the final price of electricity here. So to conclude, we can say that actually there are many changes that affected price simultaneously. Let's say uh, changes in fuel prices, rise of carbon costs, or decrease of demand and increase of renewal output, as we've seen in our what if analysis. Also, we found that the lower demand and increasing output of renewables contributed actually to the decrease in final electricity price by around 11 pounds per megawatt hour. But carbon and fuel prices, which increased in this period, particularly the carbon price, triggered the increase of electricity price by around 16 pounds per megawatt hour. Also, we found that electricity prices in UK tend to follow in general the gas price. As we've seen, gas constituted a significant part of the shared output throughout the whole period. And also, what is the most important outcome? We believe that the method we presented, the fuel switching approach, is useful, especially for the markets where either fuel may be marginal. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liliana. Very interesting and comprehensive presentation. Um, so now I would like to open the floor for questions. So please uh, raise your hand or, or open your camera uh, if you have a question. So for now, nobody. Don't be shy, but uh, I have some. So. In, in your, I mean, I think currently uh, we have new interconnectors uh, connecting uh, UK with, with, let's say, continental Europe. Uh, there was the NEMO, which was connected recently. There was the, there's one that's going to get operational or is already operational. It's already, I think, between UK and France, IFA2. Um, in your analysis, would you use, what would be the impact of those interconnectors? And because you have all these blocks where you say, okay, renewables, this effect fuel prices that affect, carbon price this effect. Would interconnectors, there are already, would it, that be another effect or, or how do you see that? And the way they are used, because that's also under discussion. So we take into account some, some things already. So for example, we take the imports and exports all the time. So it is actually also included in our analysis. And also for the coal price, let's say, I know we are actually uh, interconnected with Europe more and more. So we also took the prices which were in the, in the continental Europe and actually we calculated the impact on the final price. So this is all included in our final data already. Even this interconnectors, at least, you know, it wasn't to such extent as it is now as our research period, you know, ended in 2018. Mm -hmm. But uh, given the availability, we did as much as we can to take it into account. 
because now there's a lot of talk on on being decoupled and and not being part of Euphemia anymore that this would have an, some sort of effect, probably negative one on the prices in UK. So that's maybe something you can also see in the future. And then you, I mean, an important work is this, the paper of Hurt, which then actually look at why prices became lower or where there was a temporary or a drop in Germany. Yeah. In terms of like the variables you use, he doesn't use this, I assume, this fuel switching idea and oh, then yeah, this yeah, cubic yeah. demand. Or, yeah. No, no, so he uses direct uh, fuel prices and also linear model, as far as I remember, definitely linear. Okay, so and, and it's so it's a, it's a serious improvement or at least an advancement in, 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 the, in the sort of model. So I see there's a, a question from Angela, please, please go for it. Yeah. Hi, thank you, Liliana, for your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, I am not really aware how the um, UK market works, but uh, I see that uh, usually even in, during off-peak hours, you mentioned that the marginal price is set by the coal or gas. And I wonder why it's not the case where usually, uh, I don't know, it's not the case of uh, renewables, like which is the, pay, uh, the role of renewables in the UK market and why we don't see this. That's the first. Yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. so that's the first question. And the second one is uh, why you why you use a cubic approximation for your demand and why you think this is an accurate approximation? Thank you. Okay, so so um, the first question. Yeah, so it's about the merit order principle. So basically we don't have enough renewables. So they are still like in the, in the first part of the merit order, but we have uh, demand which is not satisfied, but purely renewables at any time. So we may also use gas or coal to uh, satisfy the, fuel, the, the full demand. So this is why the renewables are not setting the price, but definitely they're shifting, shifting uh, the, the merit order to the right. So let's say uh, in that case, we can, we can use the cheaper electricity, uh, the cheaper, uh, let's say, source so let's say renewables are the cheapest and then we look at either coal or price is the next cheapest one so that you know actually the whole price setter is shifted to a bit to be a bit lower but renewables do not satisfy the full demand if that answers your questions and why polynomials so um, as i said in the presentation we tried to uh, check for the um for the relationship between demand and price. And we tried different kinds of models. And actually it is not here in the, my presentation, but actually we see that there is this curve that actually we, we found the, uh, the peak where actually the, the price is no longer growing, but then it's upward and then slightly down again. So it was a kind of trial and error and we just chose the best fit. Yeah, it's okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think there's also a remark from uh, Professor Green. Yes, uh, thank you, Tim. It was more, in a sense, just responding on the point about Leon Hirth's paper. He had he does simulation modeling, and therefore his simulation model would have coal prices moving when moving things at times when if coal plant was marginal and gas prices moving things if gas price were marginal. So simulation models tend to do that automatically. Whereas econometric models, you have to sort of do a do the do the extra work that we did. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for the clarification. And then uh, Nicola. Yeah, thank you. So that, that might be a, a dumb question because I'm, I'm not super familiar with all the specifics of the British market, but since it, it's a long period of time, I was wondering if there has been any change in the way they, like Britain is ending their no south congestion and if that might have impacted in some ways the day ahead market. Because um, I'm, I'm thinking about this, this work with you all the time about the congestion costs, including in the UK. Um, and so like in theory, it might, might have changed, but maybe strategic behaviors have changed or something like that. So I'm, I'm just curious if there has been any big institutional change or how we should think about it? Uh, 
uh, regarding the big institutional changes, uh, I think that the most important was the changing uh, carbon prices, especially the new, uh, the changing carbon prices in Europe. And on top of that, uh, during the research period, we added our, let's say, UK carbon price as well. And of course, it influenced a lot, impacted heavily the fuel prices, gas and coal. So uh, that's why we actually have such an increasing um, electricity prices throughout this period. But about the congestion, uh, no, we didn't have data about congestions. Okay. Um, there's any more questions? I think I have. Okay, they had. So Professor Green says they had trading ignores congestion, and National Grid sorts this out later. It could ac actually it would probably impact the, the redispatch market. And in that sense, you could even have uh, dampened prices and they had to then later uh, profit from that behavior in, in the redispatch market. So it could even have the opposite uh, effect of reducing prices, this uh, increased redispatch. But then of course, not a total cost. Um, maybe one more question is that there was this one graph where you show that if demand increases, it was with the direct fuel prices. If demand increases, then the price impact of, of natural gas also increases. Um, does it have to do with the fact that there are, let's say, uh, the marginal cost of the different gas plants is somehow increasing? Or is it because there's some sort of uh, market power uh, things going on? Do you have any idea of, of that? Yes. And you you mean the merit the merit order right effects yeah, yeah. yeah so when the when the demand increases we are moving let's say uh to the right of our graph so basically uh we have the price setter is you know still the cheapest energy available but the marginal costs uh, will be higher let's say for the for the coal which is actually the one that satisfies the full demand so this is also why the renewables are basically never setting the price because we need more energy to satisfy the more the demands. So we take the second cheapest one or the third cheapest one if you know as long as we satisfy the full demand. So yeah, we are we are checking the marginal cost, and this is why um, yeah we set the order from cheapest to the more expensive fuel. Okay, so are there any more questions? Okay, we still have a couple of minutes. Um, like the fact that you have this cubic and, and, and square demand, would that mean that if you really have some demand response that this would then have a bigger than linear effect on, on, on prices in the day ahead? So is, is that, or, or I mean, that may be one kind of derivation or, or what other kind of kind of derivations you would have in terms of uh, recommendations towards future regulation or, or what exactly would be benevolent to, to improve price setting? Well, that's a very good question. About the regulation, uh, I think we haven't uh, actually found how we can improve all of this. Um, but yeah, there's, a, there's one thing to, to think of. So uh, I think for now, our model only found what factors and in what extent impacted the price. And we found that the carbon regulation impacted it in, in a lot. But apart from you know, growing renewables, um, it's hard to say, I think, for now, what other new regulation can be, can be done. Yeah. And I think one interesting result is also that you see the price impact of renewables, so that somehow I mean, there's a lot of criticism about the costs of the levies from renewables, and then, but at the same time, they do have an impact on prices, which somehow compensates a bit for the increase of the levies. But the decrease of prices was six pound, I think you found. While probably the the price paid per megawatt hour consumed of renewable subsidies would be a bit higher, but at least it's not insignificant. The price dropped these uh, six pounds. So that's, I think, also an interesting result uh, when you think about renewable subsidies and the cost to the final consumer. Um, and also the carbon emissions, right? Because that we care about as well. So there's not only impact but, on price, but yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so I think we can finalize the, the session here. I would 
like to thank uh, all the speakers, Ibrahim, Eric, and Liliana. Thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentations. And I hope to see you all around uh, in the conference and today and, and tomorrow. So thank you very much and have a good uh, remainder of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.